Well, good afternoon all and welcome. Nice to see you again. Well, I can't see you, but you can see me. But nice to be back together again and uh, looking forward to the last in this series before I take a summer break when we're going to look today at uh, the vineyards of Chablis and the Macanay, including Puy Fuisse. And I wanted to do these two because I've actually just been spending some time in the last uh, couple of weeks in both those regions. So I've got the, the most up-to-date information. So uh, we'll start in the north. We'll start with Chablis. Um, and please keep uh, your comments coming on the chat. Uh, any questions you have also either on the chat or question and answer. And uh, we will take our time over the next hour or so to go through these two regions. So, uh, <coughs> Scott, if you could let me have the first map, please. So here we have uh, the general Chablis region. Doesn't include the outlying areas like Sambri, Côte d'Oser, Epinoy, Tonnerre and so on. Uh, which are becoming more interesting with global warming. There are some people making some good wines there. Um, but we're just going to look today at Chablis, so we don't attempt to do uh, too many different things. I hope you can see that map quite clearly. It's got um, one, two, three, four colour schemes to represent the four quality classifications of uh, Chablis. So on the outside, pretty much scattered the whole way around, um, Perhaps somebody could say if you can see my mouse hovering around, sometimes my mouse shows and sometimes it doesn't. Uh, but the area that's in that light uh, brown uh, colour, um, very pale maroon perhaps, is the Pitti Chablis. So it's mostly around the edge of the area and it's mostly not on the classic Kimmeridgean soil. So the reason why the rest is on Kimmeridgean soil is because the valley of the river Serrain has, across the centuries, millennia really, cut away other layers of different forms of limestone and revealed this Kimmeridgean, it's got its special marine fossils in it, which gives you the classic Chablis character. So the Pitti Chablis is typically on Portlandian or one or two other soil types, and so it doesn't have quite the same zest and zing and saline character and little bits of iodine, uh, but can still make some very good wines. And there's quite a lot of it now, there's over a thousand hectares. Um, and if there are two areas where I think uh, if I were uh, going to try and source my Petit Chablis, uh, one would be up at the top here um, around the village of Ligne Royale in particular, uh, seems to make really good um, Petit Chablis. And the other one is up above the Grand Cruz, running behind Grand Cruz which is often called, a lot of it's behind Les Clos, and so you, you may see if somebody puts a name to it, Sur Les Clos, above the Clos. So those would be my two classic choices for Petit Chablis. And if I could name uh, maybe three producers, um, then uh, Domaine Roland L'Aventureur, now his son's in charge, they have a terrific Petit Chablis, and indeed their regular Chablis is good. So they're based up in Ligne Rale. Uh, the second would probably be Samuel Bio, um, who is based in Chablis, but his Chablis comes, Petit Chablis, comes from Sur Les Clos. And the third, which in fact is um, in neither of those areas, is Didier de Fay and his brother of Domaine Bernard de Fay. Uh, they have a Petit Chablis, which unusually, it's close to the Vaillant Premier Cru, and unusually it's actually on Kimmeridgean soil. And that, every year, I score very highly. So uh, those are, are going to be my, my Pitti Chablis uh, selections. Unless it's one of those or some other Pitti Chablis that you know about and have a particular reason uh, that you want to buy it, it's not clear to me that Pitti Chablis has much to offer uh, over um, in contradistinction to regular Chablis, because it's not that much less expensive. The differential might be 10%, maximum 20%. And as I say, it's rarely on the Kimmeridgean soil, so it's, it's, it's not an obvious choice for me, um, unless it's one of those top names. So we move on to Chablis, and here you've got a lot more. You've got more, three times the volume in, in Chablis compared to Petit Chablis. Of course, there's always a possibility that uh, 
the faction that wants to expand might increase the amount of Chablis, either with new vineyards or by raising Petit Chablis upwards. This already happened once during what I refer to as the Civil War of the 1970s. And there are a few matterings in that direction. The argument being uh, by the people in favour of that is that it's really important to be able to keep Chablis at an affordable price in the supermarkets, airlines, other mass market outlets, uh, so that Chablis is always in front of people uh, wherever they go. Um, not an argument that I buy into, but but you can you can make it nonetheless. So the corners for Chablis then. Um, some of the best bits are in between where the uh, Grand Cru's, sorry, not the Grand Cru's, the Premier Cru's are lying. So the Premier Cru's tend to be uh, here, for example, in Vaillant and Montmartre. Uh, in fact, maybe we can um, move to the next map, if you would, please, Scott. There's a little bit more room to play with. So you can see this, um, the greeny blue, as opposed to the pure green, is where the village uh, is. So if you're here or here um, or here, for example, you are on the dips in between the Premier Cruise, and these can be pretty high class uh, locations for Chablis. Um, but they're not the only ones because you've got Chablis all around. If we may now go back to the previous map. Uh, apologies for messing you around. That's great. So let me talk about the sectors for Chablis and I'll, I'll, I'll go around in, in uh, clockwise. So for, we'll start at midnight around Melini, Vili Melini. This was the area that in the previous civil war had an enormous amount of uh, Chablis designated when it didn't exist before. And uh, um, that's something, that they're, they're mostly not on Kimridgen, it's mostly on Portlandian. Uh, I've had some good wines from there, but it's not going to be my favorite region. If we head on down around fontenay pre chablis so here you've got uh, a valley uh, just beyond the premier crew of Forshom. It's quite steep-sided, uh, south-facing or north-facing, southeast or northwest, if you like. So that's going to make a difference, and certainly in ripening terms. But there are some pretty good wines in Fontenay, definitely an interesting place to look. And um, while we're about it, uh, I'll mention a few producers in most of these areas because the most classic names tend to be based in Chablis. But in Fontenay, you've got uh, the very good domain Nathalie and Gilles Fevre, so cousins of uh, the, the William Fevre tribe. Um, you have also got, uh, I think, uh, a real up and coming domain um, in domain Vrigno, Guillaume Vrigno. Um, so, I mean, he's, he's been doing it for a little while now, but each time I go, I'm, I'm more impressed. So uh, he's organic um, and certified as such. Uh, and there are a couple of others there who I have still um, yet to get to see. Uh, Domain Ventura would be one. Um, so uh, there may be more to tell you about in Fontenay on a future occasion. Um, Fie is uh, just a little hamlet, uh, 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 which uh, I don't know so well. I haven't actually been to see a particular producer in Fie. So we'll move on to Flee, F-L-E-Y-S, but pronounced as two syllables, Flee. Uh, and here are some really good sources of domains. Um, so you have Domain Grosso, who are very classic and have lots of Premier Cru's to choose from. Good Valley, very sound winemaking. Daughter Ev is now taking over more and more from her parents, but parents still working full time. Just been to see an up and coming domain called Charlie Nicole. Um, who, who's got some good ideas and has a couple of uh, old vine bottlings, including a Chablis um, at Aspera. Um, and the Chateau de Flay came to my notice a year or two ago. Um, I think it's still work in progress, but they have a really good Mont uh, They have their own Claude du Chateau as well. Uh, and I get the impression that that's a domain that's on the rise. Um, I haven't yet been to see Domain of Merlier, which would be another well-known name uh, in that village. Uh, and there are a couple more too. So flee worthy of uh, our attention. That brings us on to Beru. So if you're here, Vivier and Beru and most of Flea, uh, you're actually in straight Chablis territory uh, with very little in the way of um, uh, Premier Crew here. 
Um, Voku Pan belongs to Shishe, you just got Forno blowing to flee. Um, but in Beru, you have the Chateau de Beru and the de Beru family, and the, the daughter of the house, um, who's just had a daughter herself, Celeste, but the daughter is called uh, uh, Athenais, and she uh, got the bug. It was, only, it was her father who replanted after years of, of nothing, no vines being planted there. But Athenais came back in 2004 or five, written around there. Uh, then she got the organic bug, developed that further into biodynamic and pretty natural as well. Low sulfur if she can help it, but she's prepared to, if need be, make the choice vintage by vintage. So you're like 2018, maybe had to a little bit. Uh, and she's got lots of um, different vintage, uh, sorry, vineyard designated Chablis with the special one is the Clos de Beru, which is really quite expensive for a straight Chablis. Um, but though I didn't especially enjoy the wines when I first met them sort of around the place, now I've been and visited several years in a row, I'm convinced. And she's got a really good uh, winemaker with her, uh, a girl called Gael, who uh, is also totally on the same track and between them they're making something special, but they're keen to keep it reliable and not to disappear off into deviations. And now we move across to one of my favorite villages, Shishe, pure white fruit around Shishe. Um, two good dom domains are Didier Pique, whose wines are slightly more generous, and domain Uda, Nathalie Uda, whose wines are very much in the tight, chiseled, um, slightly higher acidity um, level. Uh, and like everybody else in this area, both those domains have uh, Premier Cruz and Vaucoupin and either Vosgros, it's called, it's unusual to pronounce that first S, but they do, or Vosgero, which is a subsection of it. Um, and then the next sector that we have to play with is uh, out here in the extreme southwest of the region, Prey and Koji. Prey is the fiefdom of Jean-Marc Brocard, who was one of the expansionists of the 1970s, but now would be rather keener on uh, uh, being more, more limiting, I would say, uh, uh, expansion. Um, his son, what's interesting is that Jean-Marc Broca um, made his name as being very commercially successful, but also good quality Chablis. And his son Julien has gone totally into the biodynamic way of doing things, they're not natural. Uh, and when you go and visit the estate, you have on the one hand this feeling of uh, a commercial operation, there's uh, a, a big visiting uh, place, I think there's a restaurant, there's certainly lots of um, merchandising going on. And yet you've also got this energetic, dynamic, um, biodynamic, state-of-the-art uh, approach as well. And there are a couple of other domains in the same village which uh, sort of sparked off uh, the Brocars. Is Clotilde Daven, who was his winemaker for many years, and there's also his uh, daughter and son-in-law, uh, Frederick and Celine Gagan, um, uh, who are also based in the same village. So that really is the, the Broca fiefdom, if you like. And Corgi over the way uh, has got two domains of note who are in the um, slightly more experimental area. You've got Alice and Olivier de Moore, um, not biodynamic, but absolutely naturalistas and also Thomas Pico of Domaine Patelou, who's uh, uh, playing around with much longer aging of Chablis. Um, and then we come to the village of Mie, um, which is really just vigneron after vigneron after vigneron, two main families who are Damped and De Fay, uh, and slightly interrelated as well. But uh, Domaine Daniel Damped and his sons Sebastien and Vincent uh, is excellent, and also um, the main uh, uh, Bernard de Fay, who I mentioned earlier for his Petit Chablis, uh, very high class. I mean, Michel Barra is good. And there is a youngster, no direct relation um, of Vincent Dovisar, but Fabien Dovisar uh, of the main Jean Dovisar, I think is really exciting in this village. Um, Poinchy has got uh, Isabelle and Denis Pommier, who are um, uh, organic. Um, a little bit of wood treatment in their wines, but quite successful. Also, Laurent Tribu, who is um, uh, married to Adobisa. Um, and further afield in Ben, I'm less familiar with, you've got Louis Moreau, um, one of that extended well-known Chablis family, and one or two other people. They're mostly working reasonably new vineyards, because the premier crews of Vaudigno, Vaudevay, and also Côte de Savon 
here uh, were all promoted in the 1970s and hadn't been much planted before then. And then we'll come up to La Chapelle Vopeltaine, uh, the late Edmar Boudin based there, uh, the excellent Jean-Claude Bessin, um, uh, the most pessimistic wine producer I think I've ever met. He seems to be a bit more relaxed now that he's reached retirement age and uh, he's still working full time, but his son Roma has officially taken over. Uh, they would be um, uh, a, a couple of notes. And I also went for the first time to an uh, organic producer called um, uh, Philippe Goulet, whose wines I found very interesting. And then up in Lignorel, definitely the star house is Roland L'Aventure. So that's a quick uh, scamp around in general, the villages and the producers. The other, the top Chablis names are based in Chablis itself. So if we can go to the um, more detailed map, please, Scott, again. Uh, Elias asked the question, the grower told me recently there are only five growers in all of Chablis and 100% hand harvested. Is that true? And if so, do you see this changing in the future? No, I think there are more than five who are all 100%, or I suppose some of them might occasionally bring in a little bit of Chablis uh, in an emergency. But um, broadly speaking, uh, you've got your Ravenos, Dovisars, Ioni, Vaucare, Bessar is now all hand harvested. Now that's quite recent. Um, uh, um, uh, the pensons are now all hand harvested. Uh, a few others have, have told me the same. I can't immediately think of uh, all the names, but I would reckon it's, it's 10 or a dozen now. And the tendency is heading a little bit in that direction, uh, though it's, it's not run away. The thing that has changed and is continuing to change is that more and more people are using indigenous natural yeasts now rather than store-bought yeasts, and that's definitely a big help. Thank you for that question. Um, so if we talk now about Premier Cruise, um, there are 40 odd in total, but they boil down to many fewer, and I'm not going to go through all 40, um, but I will just take some headline, headline names and um, mention some of my favourites. Outside the first division, but two I really like, I think I mentioned before, Vaucoupin down here. Uh, let's give it a, uh, hold on a half second. Into my heart mode. We'll give Vaucoupin a heart. Well, I'll give Cote de Leche a heart as well. It's a, it's a very nice slope that faces pure um, southeast, um, overlooking Chablis itself. Um, then you have um, really five big boys after that. You have Vaillant, which has got all these different sectors. Uh, Montmain, which also has lots of sectors. Mont de Milia, Monte de Tonnerre, and Fourchon. So uh, let's then go into those in a little bit more detail. Um, Vaillant has got, wait, some you'll never see. Uh, Lelis actually ought to be out on its own. That's this little bit up at the top here. Um, but uh, it's a different style. You've actually gone over the crest of the hill. It's slightly more, it's north facing now rather than southeast, or it's east and northeast. Uh, but it just makes a different style of wine from Vaillant. Vaillant is a very dry wine. It's always a crisp, almost smoky finish. Typically white fruit, sometimes a little bit more yellow fruit as we get white, um, as we get riper. But apart from Vaillant, the other individual part you're most likely to see is Sechet, just next door there. Uh, for example, Dovisa has one, uh, Samuel Bio has one, uh, Louis Michel has one, and Seche is even drier still, as the, the name actually means that. Um, but if you want classical seafood Chablis, then I think Vaillant is a great place to be. Montmain is interesting because it's, it's a long uh, uh, vineyard and it's actually divided into um, three parts, uh, and this is the one maybe with Fourchon would possibly be another, but especially Montmain is a premier crew where everybody tends to bottle separately their different bits. So you've got Montmain at the nearest to Chablis end, slightly lower down. Uh, it often has a reductive character, um, uh, a little bit, not so much smoky, but a bit of the gun flint in there, um, which I think is, is actually very valuable um, because in this time of global warming, it gives you a little bit more grip, a little bit more tension. And I thought the 2019 Chablis from Montmain were very successful. 
Le Forêt in the Middle, made famous in particular by uh, Vincent de Vissa. He's his classic premier crew. There's a bit more blue clay in, uh, in, in the soil here. And the wines tend to be a little bit richer and nicely complex and quite nicely perfumed. And then you have Le Buteau, which is over at the West End. Uh, it's higher up, but it's also a bit enclosed in a valley. So in colder times, this would ripen less. In warmer times, it becomes more of an amphitheater and this ripens the most and it tends to be the most powerful. And my way of explaining it is that you have the aromatics of the left bank, so where we've been so far, this side of the river, the River Serra, um, which tend to be more in white fruit rather than yellow, but you have the structure and the body of the right bank. Now we'll scamper over to the right bank and I will go from the bottom up to the top. So we begin with Montemilia, uh, which is all one. It doesn't have any subdivisions. Uh, it's mostly uh, directly south facing. It's quite a lot of clay in the soil, a little bit of Portlandian down moss, so it's a very full-bodied uh, Chablis. So here we're much more into, uh, well it could be river fish if it were a creamy sauce, but definitely not into the um, um, shellfish. And I would also choose to serve this sort of wine with um, uh, chicken, for example, white meats. And that would be true of Monte de Tonnerre, which is probably the most powerful of uh, the Premier Cru's. Depends exactly where you are. Where I put the heart is in a bit called Les Chapelot, which Rabineau sometimes bottles separately, but often doesn't. Um, but otherwise, you're really in the heart of uh, um, uh, Chablis Premier Cru territory with more weight, yellower fruit here for sure. Um, if you happen to be further up, you can see it heads up into the Valley of the Côte de Brechin, and the wine will be a little bit leaner. And then just north of the Grand Cruz, you have all of Forchem, which includes, I haven't given it a heart yet, Voleron. And if there's, if there is a premier crew and a half, uh, you know, or the next ones, which you could conceivably have added to the Grand Cruz, they would be Monte de Tonnerre at one side and Voleron on the other side. It's really quite similar to Grand Cru Les Prayers. It's got a lot more weight than the rest of Forchem. Um, and the bit of Forchem that people occasionally bottle apart, aside from Voleron, is up at the top here. Uh, long more. Otherwise, it's normally for shown, and you also have Vaupilon and Côte de Fontenay, but they're almost never bottled apart. For shown goes back to being white fruit. It's quite soft in style, a little bit less grip than some. Um, and uh, I think it's very good, but it's, as you'll have gathered from what I've said so far, it's not quite my favourite. And finally, while we're in, in the cruise, let's move up to the Grand Cruise. And here they are, some of them all in a huddle. Um, and I'll do them from south to, uh, north to south, I think. So begin with prayers like Voleron. The image I have for prayers, it's, it's, it's like, um, the texture is like cashmere. It's sort of soft and woolly and, and enveloping and delicious. Um, but uh, um, perhaps not quite as much tension as some of the others, apart from the fact that two producers have a slice of prayers that drops down uh, on the same slope as Vaudizier, and they would be uh, Vincent de Vassin and William Ferve. And that gives their prayers a greater density, intensity, I should say, and a greater tension than the others. Bougro next to it, so that's prayers out of the way, and now Bougro here. It's on a little bit of a plateau. It's like prayers, but with a little bit less distinction on the uh, plateau. But then there's an incredibly steep slope dropping down to the main road below. Uh, called the Côte de Bougereau um, by uh, William Fair, amongst others. Uh, and that is absolutely driven, very, very high intensity, great tension, and I think is pretty special. Next up is Vaudizier, the Valley of Desire. It will depend where you are because it slopes down into the valley uh, floor, and so you can either be southwest or northeast. No, I got that wrong, southeast or northwest facing, which will make a difference in the ripening. But in style, I find it next to Les Clos. It um, can be, get a little bit hotter, but uh, uh, Vaudizier is one of my big favorites. Um, adjacent to that are two Renouille and Valmure. Renouille is mostly made, two thirds is made by the cooperative uh, La Chablisienne, and they do produce pretty good wine there. But it's a ripe, spicy, it, it sees the sun, it's facing southwest, uh, lots of sun. It tends to be um, quite spicy at the finish, which is useful because it uh, gives it some grip. Um, uh, but this is definitely a food wine. Um, 
And it's called Grunui not because it would be good to go with frogs' legs, but because it's close to the river and they probably were frogs that used to be going quacks quacks away below it. Valmior after that is, uh, you could say it's similar, Valmior, the right valley, as opposed to Vodizia, the Valley of Desire. But Valmior is the least chablis like of the seven Grand Cruz uh, and the most Cote d'Or like. Um, it's a pretty warm site. You get plenty of ripe white fruit, <clears throat> deep concentration, but less of the saline tension in Valmior. And then Les Clos, which is the biggest, uh, probably most people's favourite, but even though it's the biggest, it's the most even. Okay, it's going to vary a little bit between top of slope and bottom of slope, particularly in 2019, where the top of the slope uh, on much thinner soil had extremely low yields, whereas the bottom had a bit more clay in the soil, retained the water better, and was an almost normal yield. Uh, but Les Clos, it is it's absolutely the most intense pure white fruit based on, I, I just get this image of a bench of limestone um, whenever I put a glass of Les Clos in my mouth, um, and it absolutely retains the tension that you want. And around the corner is Blanchot, starting on the same uh, elevation and uh, um, exposure as Les Clos, just about, but then it heads up the side valley and it does get that, that bit cooler as you start to go up. And this is a less intense wine. Personally, I think it is better without oak and the others will support oak. And it's all about uh, white fruit and particularly little white flowers, the, the Edelweiss Grand Cru, I call Blanchot. I didn't put the hearts on term Blanchot, but just to confirm them. Um, so that's the rundown of what they are. Um, I would only really recommend um, the Grand Cru's with age, so either buy them young because you're happy to age them yourselves, or else um, drink them mature, but I would steer away from picking them off a restaurant list when they're less than seven years old in a good vintage, preferably ten. Otherwise, I think the Premier Cru's are the top value in Chablis. Let me just tell you a little bit about the um, uh, last three vintages and also maybe touch on the star producers in Chablis itself. So the last three vintages, uh, and uh, as I said, I've just been there, mostly tasting 2019s, retasting some 18s and discussing 17s. And 2017, probably I underrated initially. Um, and now it looks like a really great classic Chablis vintage. The reason I underrated it was because it was a year with significant frost damage in Chablis, following on from 16, which was really bad as well. And everybody was a little bit in that mode when they say, oh, disaster, hardly made any wine and, and so on. So the imagery coming back from the producers at the time was not that positive. And though I like the wines, I probably should have gone even higher. And Whereas in the Cote d'Or, I love 2014 top and 2017 behind. Here in Chablis, 2017 is up there. Occasionally in 2014s are a tiny bit on the shrill side, more prominent acidity. And 2017 has got a great balance. Accessible, re really, uh, sorry, relatively young, but capable of aging. <clears throat> 2018, everybody told me it's the vintage of the century, by which it turned out they meant they made more wine than they could ever imagine making. Uh, even the serious people made uh, absolute maximum of what they're allowed to and possibly even a little bit more um, because the grapes all yielded much more. The wines are really good. Uh, there's plenty of them. It was absolutely a necessary vintage for the region, so they're extremely happy. But at the end of each tasting of 2018's last year, I asked the producer, OK, you've told me it's the vintage of the century, but which do you really prefer privately, 2017 or 2018? And they all said 2017. But I can recommend 2018s. Uh, as I say, it's a big crop. The wines don't taste dilute. They have maybe a touch less personality, and one or two of them are higher in alcohol. Uh, and we'll just check in on that because picking in 2018 began at the end of August. And in 2019, picking was anything up to 10 days or two weeks later. So let's just look at this. 2018, big crop, picked very early, high alcohol hot summer. 2019, also a hot summer, a low crop, which ought to concentrate things, um, and picked 10 days to two weeks later than 2018. So you could expect higher alcohol, lower acidity, over rich wines. And it hasn't worked out that way. 
It does depend from producer to producer, but quite a few people have ended up with lower alcohols in 2019 and 2018. For example, at Raveno, uh, they've come in at between 12.7 and 13.2, even though they picked on the 10th of September as opposed to the 30th of August the year before. Uh, who else? The um, Edouard and Eleni Vacare, who are amongst the, the rising stars, uh, they're also sort of 12.2 to 12.5. It's not everybody that way. Um, some people, uh, Dovisa, who is not a particularly late picker, but, for, but uh, makes judgment on acidity and felt that the wines weren't yet tasting right. He picked only a tiny bit later, if later at all, than the people I just mentioned. And he's come in nearer 14 degrees. And uh, also Benoit Troin, who's one of the domains, is normally a very, very early picker. But again, he judged from the acidity that he could wait. He's also 13 and a half to 14 degrees regularly. So what do they taste like? Does this mean that this is one of those hot, heavy and somewhat clumsy vintages? And the answer is absolutely not. Um, I'm uh, entirely happy to, to vouch for the quality of 2019s from what I've tasted so far. They all of them have classic Chablis character with the saline tension at the end. Um, they all show their terroirs very well. They're not hidden in the way that 2009s were at the start, and I was expecting to see something more like 2009. The only thing I would say uh, is that the style of the fruit is more mature. The, the aromatic perfume uh, definitely goes into yellow fruit, uh, even a little bit of, of sort of musky tropical flavors. But on top of the cl classical um, Chablis core, and one or two of them were a tiny bit soft to taste as early as this, though I think they'll gain tension uh, as long as um, they're made by one of the people who matures in stainless steel for a second winter. That always tends to firm the wines up, give them more precision. So it does depend slightly one producer to another. Um, so we can't call it as a across the board world beating vintage, but it's definitely a very good one in a style that where the heat has given interesting aromatics and perfume, but hasn't taken away Chablis character. And maybe just to finish up at this end um, of, of, of Burgundy with notes on a few absolute favourites. We've talked about Ravenna and Dovisa for years as being out on their own. Dovisa, Vassal Dovisa hasn't changed the style he makes at all. Ravenna have changed somewhat, but amazingly, it's making their wines, I think, even better. Uh, change of generation there with um, uh, Isabel and her, her cousin Maxime having taken over fully from um, uh, Bernard and Jean Marie's almost retired now. Um, and they've also got the new winery um, about seven, eight years ago, which has really made a difference. And they're now introducing bigger wood and they've got rid of all their little half foyer barrels. Um, so I think they're absolutely out there at the top of the tree. Half a dozen other superstars would be William Fevre, Christian Moreau, uh, Louis Michel, B.O. Simon, Samuel B.O., uh, having left the B.O. Simon domain. And Samuel B.O. is actually in my top three overall. Uh, Benoit Troin, and a load of other names who are very close into that uh, domain Pinson, Mathieu Fevre, Grosso, Moreau Noda, La Roche, Jean Claude Bessin. Uh, Jean Collet, now that Romain Collet is making the wines, the Damps and Defairs of Me, I mentioned, uh, Duplessis, very interesting wines. Uh, the Chablisien is very, very decent as well. And a few up and comers, I mentioned um, Fabien Dobissard, Domaine Jean Dobissard, Guillaume Vrigno, Athenais de Barou, and uh, the young Vaucarets, uh, Edouard and Elodie. Uh, there will be more than that, and there, I've got a few more domains that I need to go and see and check out. But those are some personal favourites in the region. Just before we go away, uh, check that now we have no more um, questions to worry about in a minute. Uh, so I will move on and say if you have anything more you want to ask about Chablis. And we'll go and look at the other end of Burgundy, which I think is a fascinating place at the moment. Like Chablis, there are many, many more people who are developing interesting um, offerings. And, and in both regions, there are very few people who've gone to sleep and uh, 
uh, and not improving what they're doing. Uh, Doug, hi Doug. Um, I have indeed checked out Domain Henri and I, could, I should have put them up there. Uh, I went to see them, um, uh, I went on Friday of um, last week, which meant that instead of getting a very delightful Margot Laroche, I got her father Michel, but uh, he's the one, he's somebody who uh, you won't be able to stop him being the driving force behind whatever he's doing until um, until his days are finished. And even then, even then, I'm sure he'll still be around. Man of immense energy. <coughs> Great. So we go down to the Maconnais and um, during the French version of lockdown and the first uh, slight relaxation of it, we were allowed to drive 100 kilometers to go places and from my house, Chablis was 105 kilometers, but I could get down as far as Puy Fuisse in just 98 kilometers. But in fact, I waited until the greater relaxation in June before I really got going. I'm going to scamper through quite quickly um, the Macon village area, but I've just been there um, uh, during last week. Um, well, uh, this, this week we've been having, um, and I, I made some interesting discoveries. So if you're heading down south, I would um, maybe the night before get as far as Tonius here uh, with, with, with the heart and um, not for its immediate wines, but because there are, I think, four different uh, Michelin starred uh, restaurants um, in a, what's a really small market town. The grand old classic was Greurs and these days it's Les Terrasses, it's the one which I know best. Uh, uh, the other three I haven't actually managed to get to. Um, but uh, I can strongly recommend Les Terrasse. So then you can take one of these little roads in black and, and, and zoom down through the villages. I'm not going to talk about all of them, um, but I'm going to start a little bit further away with Bray because it's, it's out on the edge, never really been much uh, regarded before. There's some good red wines in this area, but there are two vibrant young domains. Um, uh, there's the Boisseau family of the main Mouton, um, who are making loads of really exciting cutting edge uh, wines and I'm due to go and visit them I hope in the next month or so and also Domaine de la Tali uh, in a very similar style. So it's sort of straight Macon or Macon hyphen Bray or probably some things that are outside the appellation as well um, but worth a look if, if you want to experiment with cutting edge. Then coming back uh, more main line, uh, Chardonnay Actually, there aren't many growers in Chardonnay, and uh, I don't think um, the village has given its name to the grape, and I'm sure that the grape hasn't given its name to the village. Um, but a couple of producers in the Cote d'Or who make very good Macon Chardonnays would be uh, the, the Lafont, the Héritier du Comte Lafont, of a Macon Chardonnay, Claude de la Crochette, and also uh, Jean-Marc Boyot, who's got several different single vineyard bottlings from Macon Chardonnay. But actually, the growers who have most of it locally come more from the village of Ushizi and um, the Sales and the Talmars between them make extremely good, uh, not expensive commercial, uh, I don't mean that pejoratively, but they're not trying to be modernist cutting edge, they're trying to supply uh, good volumes of decently made wine. Um, and then over here we have Cruzi, uh, which has got members of the Guillot family, um, Julien Guillot of Domaine, uh, uh, Les Vignes des Men, and uh, also uh, the Guillaume Brou, B R A U X, uh, cousins, uh, two top end domains in Cruzi. Coming on down from there, we have Luni, dominated by the cooperative, but certainly not just the cooperative. Um, uh, again, perfectly sound mass market uh, wines, and a lot of negociants also take their wines probably from the cooperative. Um, Bergy, little village tucked away, no one really uh, gets there, lovely little ancient church or chapel I should say on top of the crest. Um, loads of really old vine Gamay and some Pinot Noir planted there. Uh, Duane Chervin is, is the main domain in the village but plenty of people from Vire are, um, are making wines um, from, from up there in, in Bergy. But then we have uh, separately, Vire Classe, which were Macon Vire and Macon Classe till 22 years ago when they developed their own appellation, uh, 
and this is a striking hillside with a couple of little plateaus below the hillside, um, which is exposed out. You can see easily, it was a hazy day, but I could still see Mont Blanc uh, across the valley of the Saone. Um, so it's facing east, gets the morning sunshine, um, quite an interesting mix of soils. And what makes these uh, vineyards stand out is that they get very ripe, but stay balanced. Uh, we'll see this again when we talk about part of Puy Puise. Um, and it reminds me in a little way of California, where you can have balanced Chardonnay at 14 degrees that's retained its natural acidity. And it's got a real depth of flavor. And uh, I, I hadn't particularly enjoyed the Vire Classe as an appellation because typically I would taste one in a range of some Macon producers wines, but they just have one vineyard up there or bought in some grapes to make one. And it didn't seem very coherent in amongst their Macon village and their Puy Frises. But when I spent a day in the appellation and I went to see the top domains like Bonhomme, Tevenet and uh, Guillaume Michel, who are the, the three most classic, but I also went to see jean marie Chanel, in saint Barbe and Domaine de Chazelle, and his two domain names, but you also see under his Chanel name. Uh, those four producers, all of them impressed me. And picking dates will make a change as to whether you're picking at 12.8, 13, uh, or whether you're picking it nearer to 14, or even above 14. In the case of Tevenet, uh, Domaine de la Bonne Grand Wine can be 15 easily. Um, but all of them had this grip at the finish, and particularly this sense of white pepper and spice that emerged right at the end, uh, which held the wine in balance. So I came away much more impressed than I had been before and I thought I was going to be. There are others, uh, there's the um, various members of the Michel family, Mende Gondine also, uh, doing Gondard Perrin. So there are plenty more uh, addresses in uh, Vire Classe that uh, I need to work on and find out more. Just clear those away and we'll continue and I will uh, just name a couple more villages. Ige and Verze uh, stuck in another valley parallel a bit further behind um, uh, as Ige above and uh, Verze. Verze is of particular interest uh, between those two partly because Ankle de la Fleur, uh, having seen uh, been interested in what Dominique Lafon was doing uh, with his Macons 2004, she started investing there. And now Domaine Le Fleur have nearly 20 hectares in Verze, plus a small holding in Puy Fuisse. Um, and there's a chap called Nicolas Maillet, who was one of the first to uh, a recent move of a lot of producers to take their vines out of the cooperative and to develop their own. Uh, so there are two stars in Verze, but there are several others uh, are up and coming, maybe more recent, uh, and we'll see more of that. You've got two slopes there, a west facing and an east facing, and I'll be interested to uh, discover more and see exactly what's what. The Le Fleur one's typically west facing and Nicolas Maillet has both, but uh, a little bit more on the east facing. And the final main grouping of um, the Macon village are the ones which are, there's this valley with the TGV uh, and also a fast road up through here. And so it's on the edge of saint veron puy fuisse but you have a number of villages in there, uh, some which are um, the same names as the villages of puy fuisse so you might see macon Vergisson or macon uh, fuisse some of the same names as the saint verons you can see macon d'Aveille, macon Loche. Uh, but also you have pierre clos um, which is the favorite village for example of um, jean-marie guffins guffins Hainan. Uh, also a really good um, small producer called France Chagnolot. Uh, La Roche Vineurs, where my, my friends Olivier Merlin come from. That's some other up and coming names there too. Um, and Milly Lamartine, which is the headquarters of the Eritier Comte Plafond. Boussier, Domaine de la Sarazinia, several people have, have single vineyard bottlings from Boussier as well. So lots to see, lots to do. And now we've got a choice of 20, 30, 40 different interesting smallish or medium sized sometimes uh, producers making macons which are worthy of interest. And it does frustrate me a little bit that on a smart restaurant wine list, you might see 20 different, 30, 40 different references to Chablis wines and there'll be one macon.
plus maybe a San Barrow wine, a very classe, and a couple of Puy Fuisse, sure, but only one Macon. Disappointing, because the wines are really good. And nowadays, they're not being sort of bottled Vista and shoved out into the marketplace in a rush. Uh, there are some are barrel aged, some in stainless steel, but uh, care is being taken to keep yields down, uh, to mature the wines on their lees and produce something worth having. Which brings us to Saint Véron and then the various Puy's. Saint Véron is a slight, I called it a, a, a bastard uh, a, appellation because um, it used to be uh, bits of Macon just above Puy Puisse on this side here. Boing, boing, boing. Uh, villages of Davaye and Prise, or it used to be what was called um, Beaujolais Blanc in, for example, Laine in saint Véron itself. Um, so it, it's not completely consistent. Um, uh, and you, it's a halfway house between good Macon village and a slightly lighter version of Puy Fuisse for the most part. Uh, interesting individual sites, uh, however. Uh, and then you have Locher and Vinzel, uh, and I think we'll talk about them. I think we'll go to the next map, if we may. These two are called pre Locher, pre Vinzel, and they're slightly interchangeable. You can put Locher into Vinzel, but not the other way around. Right, uh, you're going to have to bear with me here because this map isn't vastly clear because it comes from my book and we didn't have room. Uh, even on double page spread, we couldn't uh, map all the vineyards, uh, the, the communes together in a logical order. So in fact, you have three villages here, here, and here. Uh, I'm gonna put the hearts on them, which are Loche, then Vanzel, which are Puy Loche, Puy Vanzel, and then Chantre, which is part of Puy Fuisse. Now they're all on the same east facing slope, similar to what we were talking about in Macon Vire. Um, there's not that much difference. I mean, almost my favorite vineyard of any of them is in Vanzel, which is Le Car here. The Brett Brothers Domain de la Souffrandia, Puy Vinzel Le Car is an absolute stalwart for me. Um, good wines from Loche, but um, the slopes aren't quite as, as marked as here in Vinzel. And then coming on into Chantre, we're now into Puy Fuisse territory. And the interesting thing about Puy, Puy Fuisse is that after 10 years of hard work, they are at last going to introduce some premier crews. And I'm really happy with that. So I'll just clear what we've got of the hearts so far. And I will start mark marking out the vineyards, which are gonna be Premier Cruz. So um, you have Oka, I mentioned Le Car in Vincel, but a similar name, Oka, and the car tends to be meaning the quarter, the bit, the quarter where the rich people uh, have their land because it's the best bit. Uh, so Oka is gonna be a Premier Cru in its own right. Um, there's quite a well-known one called Clorissier, but it won't go all the way down the slope. Um, we then have, I may not manage to mention uh, all of them, we have one called Chevrier. It's here and it's going to include the vineyards around it, not just Chevrier. And that's more south facing. Um, it's quite a shallow soil. Uh, it's not one of the deepest and richest um, Premier Cruz that Pufisa is going to have, but it's very attractive. Um, and the last one, all on its own, uh, Le Clos de Monsieur Noli, made famous by Domaine Vallette. And Domaine Vallette have the curiosity, I used to work with them back in the 90s, when uh, their Clos de Monsieur Noli used to have two years in barrel. And then it went to 30 months, then it went to 42 months, then it went to 54 months, then it went to 72 months, six years in barrel, um, new wood, unracked. And I just thought, uh, this is a risk I can't take. Um, They've also headed down the sulfur-free route quite a lot. I'm fascinated by their wines. Occasionally, they have some absolutely great bottles. Um, I came across an old, something like a 2001 Puy Vanzel of theirs the other day, which had held up very nicely. Um, but I would rather they sell directly to the um, consumer than uh, risking being the intermediary in between. Other top domains based in Chantre, uh, you've got the um, Chateau des Cars, which is co-owned by Dominique Lafont and Olivier Merlin. Uh, and their vineyard, actually, they, just in 2017, they released a, a, a centenary bottling in Magnum uh, because a, a significant proportion of their vineyard was planted in 1917. Uh, also, um, there is um, a really good domain called Domaine Dominique Corner, uh, which I can thoroughly recommend. 
Now we come into uh, the village of Fuise. So this is all the east facing slope where we've been looking. And we now hop over a small crest and we come into an amphitheater, uh, a bowl uh, that sort of goes around like this. So if you're in the, the, the center of the smile here, um, you're, you're sort of east, east and a little bit of north, you're northeast or east, uh, here you're east. And, and so this eastern part of the bowl is, is really the most classic and that's pretty much all gonna be Premier Cru. Uh, the top at the north, you have the very good property of Chateau de Ronte. They haven't been included because they're very high up. Um, they're not too happy about that. Over on this side, you're west facing and it's also not the classic clay limestone. You are on a little bench of, of schist and even one or two granitic outcrops here. So these vineyards, still decent wine, but, but not going to be Premier Cru's. Uh, and you have one Premier Cru that sits out on its own, that seems a little bit weird why that would be Premier Cru, but it's Vercra. It's a gorgeous vineyard. It's a different soil type. I won't go into the detail now because we're running out of time. Uh, but it sits up on a, on a mini plateau. It's only a, you know, 10 meters higher than what surrounds it. Um, but it's a great soil and the Chateau de Beauregard uh, amongst those who, who make a brilliant wine out of it. So that's one of my top Cru Frises. Um, you've got the Chateau de Fuise, Fuise with its own vineyard, uh, Le Clos. You've got the main Ferret um, with two outstanding vineyards and several other very good ones. And it's brilliantly run at the moment by Audrey Braccini. Uh, and her two top wines are uh, Minetria and one that they currently call Tournant de Puy, but as it becomes Premier Cru, they'll have to change that name. And you've got a host of other good producers in Fuisse. Uh, the domain uh, Robert de Nogent uh, would be one. Um, Sophie Signier is making good wines. I went to see her the other day would be another. Um, oh, I'm going to leave uh, Domaine Truyer on the edge is good. Um, I'm going to leave too many out. Uh, Domaine Cordier up at the top of the hill, um, just before you go and see Chateau de Ronte uh, is, is good as well. Um, so yes, uh, lots to do there. Now this is the absolute core, the absolute heartland of Puy Fuisse, uh, mostly on a, on a slightly deeper soil. Uh, it gets all the sunshine you need. It can easily cope with ripening to 14 degrees, even 14 and a half, and not be ugly and unbalanced, not have residual heat. It's got a depth of flavor, which is almost second to none in Burgundy. You've got to be in, in the Grand Cru uh, territory or the very best of Merceau to have as much depth of flavor. Um, it doesn't lose acidity, um, and, uh, uh, but you need to want a richer style of wine. Um, you know, if, you like, if you like the much more mineral style, which where the pendulum has swung to these days, might not be your sort of, sort of wine, but if you want full-bodied classical white burgundy, then this part of Puy say is probably where you want to be. Now this is where the map uh, loses coherence because we should be just going up to the top of the map where it says Solitary Puy here and instead we're going to have to go across to the left hand page. So I apologize for that, I hope that was a clear explanation. So we've now turned up, uh, we just left say and we turned up in Solitary Puy and actually it's in two halves because you've got Puy on the right hand side of that line I've just drawn, which is similar to Fuise. In fact, Vercra continues across the border uh, and it's, it's the same on either side. And you've got some other really good vineyards down here. So again, we're in slightly fuller, fuller bodied, slightly richer style of Puy Fuise for um, these vineyards. And then you go up to Solitre and you would have seen the famous pictures of the crag of Solitre and the other one of Vergisson. Um, which is like sort of the last wave of limestone crashing on the beach of the granite just immediately to the south. Um, and here you're a lot higher up and you're beginning to get a more mineral style of, um, uh, of Puy Frise. Um, in Puy and Solitre, um, you've got uh, Domaine de la Chapelle. Um, you've also got the Chateau du Clos in Puy. And then up in Solitary, you've got uh, Dwayne de Gervais, which I think is very good. Uh, there will be others too. But my heart and, and sort of interest these days has moved a little bit more into Vergisson. And for some reason, Vergisson has always been a little bit apart. 
you've actually got a very narrow entrance to the valley here where that small stream is and the road's up. Otherwise, unless you go up through this narrow entrance, uh, Vergisson is separated from Davaye and Sautropuy. Uh, and it's acted that way. The negociants used not to come here and buy much wine. So you get many, many more owner operators. Um, and you've got uh, a south facing slope um, here, Les Crais, Marachaud, and also Sur la Roche, which is south and east. And that's actually going to be divided. This part of Sur la Roche is going to be Premier Cru, as are Marachaud and Cray. But the top of uh, Sur la Roche is not going to be Premier Cru, simply because they've arbitrarily decided that they're going to cut the Premier Crews off at 400 meters above sea level on the grounds that there are no vineyards that are Premier Crew in the Cote d'Or above that. But of course, we're further south here and, and there's a little bit of bad feeling about that. Uh, then you've got this north facing uh, slopes here, en Boulon uh, and so on. And you've also got a little group here. And indeed, another group over there, also north facing. The north facing one's not gonna be Premier Crew. Um, again, north facing was, was counted out. But in these days of global warming, you tend to pick these later, so they have longer hang time. And if you taste Daniel Barrow, or now Julien Barrow's En Boulon, for example, that's this one here, uh, that's a pretty smart wine. Um, I like it a lot. And so Barrow is a top domain for me, both the Sommet's domains, um, that's Sommet's Michelin, and um, uh, the other Sommet's. So uh, Eric Forrest, Forêt, uh, would be another. Um, uh, I don't know Roger Lassera so well, but he has a nice vineyard in this section over, uh, over, over here called the uh, Clos de France, which is going to be Premier Cru, which the Malins also have as from 2018. Some aces have on Roncheva next door. Uh, this sector is quite interesting, but most of it didn't get made as Premier Cru. Uh, so if you want a slightly more mineral style, and you probably don't want your Vergisson Prufuissés to be heading much above 13. That's their comfort zone, as opposed to the Fuissé ones. But um, if you like the slightly more mineral, fresher style, then Vergisson is the place to be. Right, well I'm coming towards the end of, uh, of our allotted hour. Um, but I wanted to talk about these two regions in, in really some detail. Um, uh, Michael, I can uh, just answer your question. Which producer uses six years in New Oak? It's Domaine Valette, and only for one wine, which is the Clos de Monsieur Noli. Um, and in fact, Robert Parker, a few years ago, wrote an article um, which was a little bit burgundy bashing. But he'd done a tasting of various Morichets, and he'd also mixed in blind with them two Puy Fuissés, or no, one Puy Fuissé, which was the Clos de uh, Monsieur Noli from Valette of 94 vintage. One Corson Charlemagne from Costurie, uh, and two Californian wines. And afterwards, um, I think his headline was California 2, Corson Charlemagne 1, Puy Fuissé 1, Morichet 0. It's his four favorite wines for the two Californians and <coughs> the two non Morichet Burgundies. <coughs> so I uh, was kindly invited because I knew the Valets. So uh, Aubert de Villene, Dominique Lafont, and a couple of others put this together. They said, okay, we'll bring the Morichets from the tasting. Uh, and uh, Jean-Francois Costery was going to bring the Corson Charlemagne. Uh, they found the Californian wines, and I brought the Valet Puy Fuissé. And we tasted them blind. And of the four non Morichets, two absolutely stood out for uh, intrinsic quality, being very, very pure. Uh, absolutely uh, intense and incisive. And they were the, the um, Custery Corton Charlemagne and also the um, uh, Peter Michael Californian wine, both very impressive. Uh, most people, including me, thought that the uh, Custery was a Morichet and the only person who hummed and hard and said he didn't think it was a top wine, but he didn't think it was a Morichet was Jean-Francois Custery, who I'm sure did recognize it with being modest. Um, and then there were two wines which were completely out of their element. Uh, I won't say they weren't good wines, but they both had a lot of betrayers and sur maturity about them, which were the um, uh, other Californian wine and the Valette Puy Fuissé. And it wasn't difficult to have sur maturity in 94 because there was a lot of rain around at the harvest. 
Um, I don't uh, mean to be negative about uh, Valette wines in general, but that was not the right wine to have chosen for 94. And I was just astonished about Parker rating it so highly. Anyway, he did. Um, and otherwise, happily, most of the Morachets uh, did show very well. And, uh, our favourite wines were two of the Morachets, plus the Corsa Charlemagne from um, uh, jean françois Koch, and very shortly behind that, the Peter Michael. Anyway, I come to an end, but I, 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 I really am excited about what I see in Chablis these days. I'm really excited about what I see in the Macaday. Uh, both areas significantly less expensive than the main part of the Côte d'Or. So please do not waste the opportunity to, to tuck into these things and uh, do not be frightened to experiment. Um, I'm going to fade away at the, uh, very shortly. It doesn't look as though there are any more questions. Uh, I'd like to uh, thank you all for signing in again tonight. Uh, I'm going to take a summer break now. I've still got a few lined up to do with 67 Pall Mall, but I'm going to have my summer weekends uh, to myself. So I'll be back um, uh, probably in, in September. Might do the old one some point in late July or August. But um, thank you for joining in the Inside Burgundy, Jasper Morris Inside Burgundy Zooms. Many of you I know already signed up to the website. If you are, then please consider it. Got to keep me in, uh, in tea and food and the old bottle of wine. Um, and uh, keep following on. You'll have seen that we've just done an interesting uh, champagne report on the website, which has had great, great feedback. I've got several things coming up. I will uh, do before the end of the summer both the Macanet report and the Chablis report, lots of tasting notes. We're looking forward to the harvest pretty much throughout Burgundy around about the 25th of August. And, uh, uh, and then on from there. So onwards, upwards, um, and everybody enjoy and stay healthy. Thank you.